as I was just saying, uh, uh, most of my paid ministry life has been involved in encouraging and equipping disciples of Jesus, and particularly to help them actively play their part in God's great mission to make disciples of all nations. That's part of Jesus' final words to his disciples, saying, what's the program now? Well, it's to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them what I've done and baptising them. And um, so I've spent a lot of time, a lot of my time, encouraging and equipping people to do that, to be involved in that. And essentially in these two workshops that I'll be leading, um, gathers together that long experience in doing that. I want to help you play your part in Jesus' great mission to make disciples of all nations. Now, I know that anyone who's been flown in to do something, from interstate no less, must be an expert, must be a guru, and uh, who's got all the secrets and going you know, to share with you the secret knowledge and give you a list of things to do to uh, flourish. Uh, I've got some news for you. Much of what we'll be considering in this session and the next is not special knowledge. It's about being a faithful follower of Jesus in the everyday, ordinary reality of life, and particularly today, in this thing we call church that we're involved with. And my hope that in this session, this session will remind you of some important things you will probably already know or may have heard, and give you a fresh motivation for the things that you're already doing, but also hope that it challenges you to step into some new ways of serving in church and uh, with some concrete ideas about what you might do as a next step. So that's my hope. The flight plan, I'm going to get you to do some thinking about your involvement with church very briefly to start with. We're going to spend some time considering God's perspective on church, why we're involved in it, uh, and particularly thinking through a mindset. That's the heart of what we're doing today, the, the sharing Jesus' mindset about church that will guide our actual practical involvement. I hope for most of the time you'll be doing quite a bit of work to tease that out in the practicalities of your own life. Play, uh, work, tease out the, that mindset in your particular context with your particular personality and context. Sound all right with me? Great. Uh, I'm going to start with you spending a bit of time thinking. Uh, and I want you to jot down some answers to those three questions. So just a very brief audit in your outlines. How are you involved with your church in the present season of life? In what ways have you been involved in your church or building God's kingdom in previous seasons? In what ways has your involvement changed over time? And perhaps why? That's not an accusative why, it's just a, a reflective why. You know, what has changed and what's caused that change? I'm actually going to give you uh, a few minutes. It's going to seem strange, a group of people quietly doing that. But I, the reason I'm doing it is it's so that the things that we talk about today have, have, have ground to land in as a reality of life and your involvement in church. So I think it's worth the three or four minutes. I'll give you time and silence just to jot down some things. How have you? How are you now? What's changed?
you might like to continue that exercise another time. I, I know the silence feels awkward, but I really do think we need to kind of be thinking about the reality of our lives and involvement as we hear God speak into that. Maybe just have a look over what you either thought about or even wrote down and maybe circle one thing that stood out for you, one thing that you noticed. I reflected on the change from working in student ministry to working for a church and uh, some of the similarities but significant changes for that in in uh, serving and ministry. You might have some other things that you noticed or popped out. Um, I want to th- talk about Jesus' mindset about church. It's a kind of a starting point. Um, this will take up more space in your booklet than allows, so I suggest you, you sort of bleed over onto page 17, the bottom half of 17, if you're trying to take notes. Um, uh, just reflect with me for a second. Being a member of a church is a bit like being a member of a family. Uh, you know, in a family there are well-worn patterns of relating to the various personalities in the family. There's the wild, adventurous child, perhaps, or the irritating uncle. I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about my own family here, but, you know. There's those well-established traditions and rhythms in family. The get-together at Christmas, the birthday celebrations, that weekly grandma and grandpa time. And family is something that you just live in. It's part of your life architecture. And occasionally, that familiarity gets shaken up a bit when there's conflict or suffering of various kinds. And it's then we, get, uh, we become more aware of what it actually means to us. More aware of that complex web of relational dynamics, more aware of what our responsibilities are. And I would suggest that it's true of church, it does tend to become familiar. It is part of our life architecture and life rhythm. something right about that as Christians. It's part of who we are as Christians. When we get Jesus, we get his church, his people. And from within, that may, it may look a little bit ordinary, in fact, a bit every day. We remember, remember a church with familiar involvements and relationships, um, and that's all fine. But because of that, it can also easily drift. Because it's so familiar, it's part of our life architecture, and drift into being too familiar. Just one of those things we do in our week. Maybe a little bit ho-hum even. It's sort of a thing we sign up for that we turn up to. Uh, even worse, it can drift into being just an optional extra, extra in our faith. There's a drift. Uh, Nikki and I do marriage preparation at our church, and uh, at right early in the early in the course that we do, we talk about marriage being like two people in canoes in the river of life. Canoes closely start out closely connect together, intimate one flesh relationship, committed to each other. Still two different people, but they're canoes closely uh, joined together. But as, the, as life goes on, you move down the river of life, the drift is to be run parallel, to sort of be co-inhabitors, to actually not be very close at all. You, you live like, it might be pleasant, but not particularly connected. If that continues over time, the drift diverts and so you get down the river this is something Nikki and I had to pull ourselves up in in marriage counseling you get down the river and you're quite in quite different places quite separate lives and the troubles can begin there and you need we say in our marriage preparation you need to consciously invest to avoid that drift and I suggest it's the same with church we need to actively work against drift to have been just one of those things we do, or even worse, an optional extra. And a great way to do that every now and then is just to remember how Jesus sees his church. Lift our eyes, consider this thing called church, look at it from God's inspect- uh, perspective. It's sort of a bit of a remember the why of church and our involvement in it. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at two passages in Ephesians to show what God reveals about what he thinks of church, what it is, why he's got it 
he's using this thing called church in his world and the how he does it, this familiar place called church, and suggests that there's a mindset that's shaped by that. There's a mindset about church and our involvement that's shaped by what God thinks about it. Uh, we're going to go to two passages in Ephesians. They're actually printed at the top of your outline, although I would suggest you get your Bibles out and look them up in your Bibles, just because we'll probably cover an extra verse before and after those particular ones. So it would be great to look them up. Um, so from, we're looking at a couple of sections, one from Ephesians 5 and one from Ephesians 4. And the question we're asking as we approach these passages is the what, why, and how of church. First of all, the what. And we'll just do a couple of runs over the passages to glean what they tell us about these things. Uh, look at the Ephesians 5 passage with me first. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Uh, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Who loves, he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his flesh, his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. What is church from Jesus' perspective? It is his bride whom he loves. It's a relationship which earthly Christian marriage points to and is shaped by. At the heart of church is Christ's love for his church. His sacrificial love expressed in the giving of himself by dying on a cross for her. His ongoing faithful love expressed in his nourishment and care for her. His purposeful love that works for the church's cleansing and growth towards completion at the day of Jesus' return. Jesus' point of view is taking its members to heaven. The Ephesians 4 passage expands a bit on just that last section of the Ephesians 5 one about Christ caring for his church as his own body. Ephesians 4 is 11 to 16 is about what Jesus is doing now, the ascended Jesus. So th this is, remember Jesus is risen and alive now. And this is what he's doing in this era. So Ephesians 4 verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself in love. Uh, Jesus, the, the picture here is the church is his body and Christ as, his, as its head. It captures the way in Jesus is, the, the, I suppose, the chief shepherd of his flock, the head. But also how, in the way this passage works out, he's the nerve centre of its life and purpose, like a head, to, head is to its body. It's a picture of uh, a body, speaks of a living organism, in which all the different parts function in harmony for the whole body's growth and vitality and stability. And as its head, Jesus provides people to play their part in the body's growth as they work together. That's the picture. The what of church, what does these passages tell us? Is Christ's beloved bride and his body. It's very, very dear to him. It's not essentially our body or our beloved, it's first and foremost his, and we've been graciously included in it through the cleansing work of Jesus. 
That's the heart of church. It's Christ, is Christ's love and provision for her. And if that's true, the idea of us letting it drift towards being just one of the many things we do in the week, or an optional extra to our faith somehow, at the edge of our lives, <laughs> is a cosmic underselling of what church is. Jesus really, really loves this church. It's cosmically significant to him. I want you to do a little imagination exercise now. This is activating. Imagine you're in a church gathering on Sunday. You might, you could even close your eyes. Um, imagine you're in a church gathering. <laughs> in your imagination, you're probably sitting in a familiar seat, as most people do when they go to church. And there are others sitting in their familiar seat. You look around the people there. Think about the people there on a you know, standard Sunday service. Um, in my mind, I'm seeing those people my age who sit up in the middle towards the back. We meet in a cinema, so... You actually can't see the people very well, <laughs> but that's where they sit and there's young families down here with the kids playing in the aisle. Who are you seeing? What are you seeing as you look at us? It might be a, quite a small group. It might be a large group. Um, I see the service leader and the preacher and the people playing music. Oh, are you there with them? How do you think about that group of people? What? How, how would you talk about them to somebody else? What maybe even the imagination size of exercises brought to mind some things about how you think about that. And I think an important step to lift our eyes is to step out from what we've just seen and remember what we've just heard. How do you think Jesus sees that? That familiar week by week gathering. <laughs> he really, really loves it. I realise it's a ragtag group of people from all sorts of places and ages, but he really, really loves it. It's like his radiant bride. Well, there's an evocative interest uh, um, picture, isn't it? He died to make this gathering possible. He's committed himself to presenting it blameless. It's his body that he nurtures so it'll grow up to be healthy and mature. He really, really loves it. And not just some idealised spiritual version of it. It's that group you're imagining. He loves it. He died for it. He's got purposes for it. My question is, do you, do you share his view? Now, I want to do a little a discussion exercise. Just, just start to spitball a bit about how, what practical differences it might make if you shared Jesus' mindset about this group of people in our day-to-day -day environment. Or put another way, what difference might it make if we loved our church like Jesus did? Okay, so I'm going to give you a minute to think and then maybe talk. This is a chance for those who think by talking to do it with the person next to you. Just what differences might it make? It's a little bit of a brainstorm. There could be all sorts of answers to that question. Just starting to think, how does that affect this and our involvement with it?
Okay. Hang on to those thoughts. That's sort of an initial brush over of how this mindset might work its way out. Bit of a brainstorm. We'll come back to that nitty gritty in a sec. Uh, and maybe fill it out a little bit. Uh, just, but I want to say, the next thing I want to say is, is, is Jesus' affection and love for his church is not just an affection. It's an active, purposeful love in those two passages. Both the passages teach us that Jesus is taking his church somewhere and has good purposes for us. And, and the passages give us Jesus' answer to the why question. You're like, What's the purpose of this thing called church? Ephesians, go back to Ephesians 5, verse 25. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. One way of saying that is he's preparing his church for heaven. For that great day of presentation. That great day when he comes to, re to establish a new creation, when those in Christ will be raised with new bodies. Bring on that day, I say, at age 61 and beyond. But so much more than that. Decayless, sinless, eternal bodies fit to dwell with him forever, face to face. That's where he's taking her. And the work starts with him in that passage, cleansing them, a, f a finished work, a cleansing her, her by the washing of water with the word. That's referring to what happens when people hear the word of the gospel and respond by entrusting themselves to Jesus as Saviour and Lord. In a sense, their old lives die with him and they are raised with him to new life. The water bit, I think, is a reference to baptism, which symbolises that, that unity with Christ, that union with Christ. When you trust Christ, it's your old life has died and you have new life towards God. We who have entrusted ourselves to Jesus as Lord and Saviour have been forgiven of all our sins, made righteous before God now. That's the starting point of church. That's how Jesus has brought us into church. We have been cleansed. But that completed work for us, that's achieved in Jesus' death and resurrection and our union with it through baptism, is the beginning of God's ongoing work in us, according to this passage. To grow us, to live out that status of righteousness more and more. To grow us in, be more like Jesus. And finally, to complete that work of perfecting us in heaven. It's a picture of a bride being presented in all her radiance on her wedding day by Jesus himself. It's, kind of a, it, it's, a, it's a lovely picture that we can all relate to. We've all been to weddings maybe even family ones. We were here in Armidale for the wedding of our uh, niece, Georgia, just the other week. And I know from behind the scenes, there was a lot that happened to present Georgia on that day. I think Rod was cooking uh, ham and cheese croissants all morning for the wedding party as they prepared and did the makeup and hair. Um, but so many, and, and for months before, for that, that time when the wedding, when the bride was presented in Radiance, she was Gorgeous, beautiful. And uh, you, you think, what brings to mind is the look on the groom's face as the bride comes down the aisle. That look of wonder and love. Even more, to look at the father's face as he walks down beside her, full of pride and love. This kind of presenting of a radiant bride, that's what Jesus wants for his church. That's what he's actively working to bring about for his church. That's his why. And Ephesians 4 describes God's purpose as maturing his body. Maturing his body. Again, 4 verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. It's a picture of a child developing and maturing to adulthood so they can stand on their own two feet and not just be pushed around by the pressures around them. 
a mature church is what Jesus is working towards. He wants his church to know him deeply, know and love him deeply. He wants his church to trust him, come what may in life, against all the pressures to not trust him. He wants his church to become like him in every way. He wants to build it to maturity, full maturity in Jesus. I guess the challenge is, do you share that purpose for yourself as a member of his church and for others in the church? This is what he's about in church. Do you share it? Do you share that why? And I just want to say, it's an ultimately fulfilling and satisfying purpose for your own life. What's most important about you is not what you've achieved, what you've accumulated, what you've experienced, what you've done. It's who you're becoming. I think it's similar for your church. It's not how big it is, how shiny it is. It's what the people together are becoming under Jesus, to be like him, fully mature. And so Jesus is passionately and actively involved in growing his church to full maturity, to present his bride without blemish, like Jesus, ready to be in God's presence forever. This is what I mean by it's cosmically significant to Jesus, what's going on here. And the challenge is, is that your view of what's happening at church or your involvement in it? Now, let's spend the rest of our time getting down to some of the nitty-gritty about how that happens and how you might be involved in it, um, how that's purpose. I've got another little exercise for you. Uh, I think there's a slide to go with this. Again, it involves you doing a bit of thinking and then talking. I want you to uh, think about three specific times where God has used other members of your church to mature and encourage your faith. Okay? Uh, could be, it'll be all sorts of things. But try to be specific. So I think, for example, of Helen McNabb, who was a high school teacher in Gunnada, who ran the ICF, invited four of us, a little group of Christians, to her place to study the Bible. What Helen taught me was, my faith belongs at school. There's a place for it here. How significant is that? Very formative. I think of Owen, who welcomed me so warmly at my first week in a new church when I moved to Sydney. Right? Huge transition point. I, I walked in the door of church and there was Owen with his beaming smile. I can still see... I mean, this is... How long ago was this? 40 years ago. I can still see his face. He took an interest in me. He talked to me. Very significant for me as I was making that transition to Sydney, sort of finding my way. I think of Robert visiting me when I got chicken pox in the first week of paid ministry. Right? I've been preparing. I'd study for three years to be here. Ready to go. It was student work. And the first few weeks of the year for student work is very important. It's when you meet new people and carries them into the group. You know where I was for that first three weeks of that first year? In bed. Couldn't do anything. <laughs> so frustrating. Rob comes to visit me and he encouraged me to just reframe what was going on. He encouraged me to think, see this is an opportunity to just be and reflect before doing. It saved me from charging in to try and prove myself. It's not a pleasant way to be saved from that, but completely reframing. He reminded me that we are often weak, but God is still powerful to work. I can't tell you how, much, how many times I've shared that, those truths with young ministers. Um, just that, that was a five-minute conversation. Shaped me. Now, it doesn't have to be as dramatic as those things, but jot down three ways in which you've been encouraged. It could be a very ordinary way. Just remember. Just See, Jesus is doing this. We should expect this to be happening. How has it happened for you? You've been encouraged by other members of your church in faith.
Okay. Probably um, one thing to take out today is as you've thought about that, is there a way you can do that with somebody else? This is the next step. The way that God has used somebody to encourage you in faith, go and do likewise. In this room, we've just thought of um, 390 different ways. Some of them might overlap. Uh, there's a huge variety in this. But just as a starting point, think, okay, I have been encouraged by others. God has used others to encourage me. Maybe I can do that for somebody else. I just want to quickly di- dig into Ephesians 4 um, to see what that say- this says about the how. That Jesus loves his church. It's his bride, his body. His purpose is to mature it into full maturity, to present it uh, at the last day as blameless and radiant. Um, how? What do these passages say about the how? What's he, how, he, how is he kind of expecting this to happen, I guess is the question. Um, Ephesians 4 tells us that he's actively providing for his church to enable it to achieve its purpose. Uh, just f- for example there, he gives gifts. Verse 11, the gifts of apostles and teachers and evangelists. You notice there are people. He gives gifts to equip the saints. Uh, if we don't have time to look at it, but 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is all about that. And uh, everyone is a gift of God to the church to build it up into Christ. Can I just say that again? Everyone is provided by Jesus to build the growth. So that the issue isn't how spectacular the gifts are. The issue is what is God going to use to build his body up through you? And, and again, there's all sorts of ways and that come. Um, there are also, it's, some of them are, might look more spectacular or more upfront. Others are, are, are the kinds of things that are just consistent Christian character. Things like mercy, things like encouragement. They're everyday things, but uh, he provides gifts of people to build up his church. And Ephesians 4 also tells us, as we heard, that every member contributes to the building of the church into maturity in Christ. Can I say that again? Every member, as it plays it, as they play their part. And the different members function, perhaps in different ways, but do so cooperatively. It's a team effort, church. I think Ephesians 4 also tells us that speaking the truth in love is a key activity for everyone in church. It's not just about the sermon, but the word dwelling richly through the teaching is really important and the reading of the scriptures. But seems to, Ephesians 4 seems to say, no, we all have a part in that ministry of the word at church. It's not primarily about being honest, you know, telling the truth, telling what you really think about people all the time. It's the truth as in the word of Christ, the truth, what God is doing in his world, the, 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 the content of the scriptures to be speaking with each other. It's about speaking the word of the gospel to each other. And notice also that love in this drives everything. That's particularly, you might remember 1 Corinthians 13. I think everybody knows about that. And, but it's not first and foremost a sort of, passage for weddings or the general idea of love it's embedded in a sustained teaching by Jesus about how every member has a part to play in building the the body it says the key thing is the key goal is building up the body and the key attitude is love love is patient love is kind if you don't have love you have all sorts of gifts If you don't have love you've got nothing love is at the heart of this functioning of the church that um, desire for others' good, particularly their growth and maturity in Christ. That, that, that's what Ephesians 4 says about everyone has a part to play. The goal is the building of the body to maturity, and the key driver is love. So other person-centeredness. That's, that's the heart of what happens when you go to church. That's what Jesus used. So a summary is there in your outline of a mindset 
lovingly building Christ's body, everyone, not just a few, in all sorts of ways, especially truth speaking, in love, formal and informal. Right? It's very easy to think of ministry as being about formal ministry, those particular people who do it. And that brings us to the idea of the ministry of the pew, the ministry of the pew. It works in this building. I know in some of your church buildings that this may not work. You've got padded seats. <laughs> but I think we know what it means. Ministry of the pew. This is the, the way I talk about everybody playing their part. It's, and it's crucial to the healthy functioning of a church. It's really important. The word is front and centre, that it's taught faithfully, that it's read publicly. Don't get me wrong, I'm not playing them off against each other. But I tell you what, it's, it's as crucial that the, the word dwells richly in the body of Christ. Uh, everybody has a part to play. Uh, it's not just the job of a few. We, uh, where we are essentially receivers of ministry, having Jesus' mindset changes, it's a game changer on that. It's a paradigm shift. The body needs everyone to play their different parts in building the body. And I think one of the effects of adopting, operating out of a mindset like Jesus is that it will include informal as well as formal roles. You know, we tend to think of our ministry in the church being on rosters. I think that's essential for churches to operate. Don't get me wrong. But I think operating out of a mindset instead of a structure means there's so many other things we'll be involved in and opportunities we will see to build this body in Christ. It will involve taking initiative as you see needs, as you meet people, not just the structured roles. I'm going to get you to do some work. I'm going to divide you into four sections of the room. And uh, I think there's a... Here we go. And again, this is... Uh, you, you won't be able to do it all with all the people in your section. So just maybe three, three or four, maybe the people in front or behind. I'll tell you what the sections are in a minute. But each one, I want, you to, I want each section to think about a particular time in church, to do with church. Uh, the first three are to do with the Sunday gathering because I think that's the most regular thing we're involved in. It's when people are gathered, so there's most uh, access to the other people in your church to build them up in Christ, but also during the week. Now, this might take a bit of thinking, but I, you've all been involved in churches for a long time, so I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident that the wisdom of the room uh, will be heard here. Now, I want you to think, in, each of the, se in the section that you're given... Um, what, how do you think this mindset of having Jesus' mindset will work out in what you say and do before a church service starts? Interesting. Before you even get there, this is part of saying, what, what might be some of the things you might do with Jesus' mindset? During the service, so from when the, the first hymn is announced, the welcome and the first hymn is announced to the end of the service, some of the ways, it could be a formal way, but remember, are there informal ways as well? After the formal gathering, it's still Jesus' people gathered. Um, what's some things you might say and do if you had Jesus' mindset? Um, it's not just if, because I know some of you, many of you do, so what, what do you do at those times? How do you express that mindset?
I want to think, one thing that you've, I want you to just for a minute think, what's one thing today that's encouraged you to ha and motivated you to do something you're already doing at church? Just think back to the audit. There's something you're doing at church, and today is said, oh, first of all, that, that's really worthwhile, but second of all, I want, to, I want it to be motivated by Jesus' mindset. So, so you keep doing it. It's not, it just doesn't become part of your life architecture. It's, it comes out of your relationship with Jesus and your understanding of what he's doing. That the things that you already do, think, how does this mindset keep motivating that for the long haul? You might, might actually go into church with a bit of a spring in your step to do the things that God has already had you doing. And the other thing I want you to think about is one thing that came out of today, one way in which you might step into something new. One way in which you might step into something new in playing your part in Jesus' church, given this mindset. One way. We've heard of a few. Uh, you've talked about a few of them. Maybe it's one of those things that somebody said they found encouraging from another church member or from your own experience. It could be... Um, so one of those three things and what you heard from somebody else. Could be what you've just heard. You say, oh, okay, that's a really, yeah, actually think about how to, the people who were there and what might be going on and pray for them during the week. Oh, that was, I thought, yeah, that was the thing that jogged my thinking. My, I hope there was a whole lot of other things there. But it's really important to have sort of a concrete, what's well, one way in which Jesus' mindset is motivating what I'm already doing and what's one possible new thing that I might do? For many of us, I think that next step that's a little bit challenging is the speaking the truth in love. The conversations you have at your small group or afterwards. Remember, the ministry of the word is not just for the preacher. It's for every member to speak the truth in love. So think of ways in which you might step into that. That's likely to be the challenging next step. It seems to be the true the, the case in most churches. People being taking courage, trusting the Lord, and speaking the truth. Things they've learned, the ways they've been encouraged, part of their story. Tomorrow in the workshop, we'll talk about our stories. Share a bit of your story with somebody. So a bit, bit more than the chit chat. There's something about Jesus in there in your conversation. Something about Jesus in your conversation and the word. Um, it's part of a church that's a Psalm 1 kind of church. A church where the word, meditating on the word, hearing the word from each other. Uh, it's just part of, the, part of that architecture. It's part of the mindset. I'm going to pray and we're going to have some lunch. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for your grace towards us in Jesus we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your faithful giving of yourself. We thank you that you have sent your spirit and the gifts on your church to grow it and mature it. We thank you for your great vision for your church of presenting a, a radiant bride and for the active way you're helping bring that about. We pray for your mindset about this familiar everyday thing we call church. Please, uh, please uh, work in all of us here today to think about our motivations and think about new things we might do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.